Okay, so I think uh, I think everybody's joined. So good, good afternoon again. Um, so uh, my name is Julian Digby. I'm a solutions consultant at EduServe. Uh, in my role, I, I look at uh, uh, cloud adoption and cloud architecture uh, with our uh, local government and other public sector uh, customers. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Omid Shiraji, uh, who's the uh, CIO of Camden Borough Council, um, and also Helena Zaum from Microsoft, um, who uh, is in the um, local government uh, focused department there. Um, just try and Um, so the agenda today, um, I'm just going to give you uh, uh, five minutes um, around the uh, cloud and, and the, um, from the perspective of um, uh, supporting new IT operating models. Then uh, Omid is going to give you um, some of his insight from uh, implementing new IT operating models across a number of uh, organizations um, in both the public and private sector. And Helena is going to then come in and discuss uh, some uh, success stories of cloud adoption in the public sector that she's been working on. So in terms of um, the opportunity for cloud for the public sector, um, it's quite often pitched, um, certainly uh, the cloud infrastructure as a service model is, is pitched as something that can help improve your service availability, um, your resilience, um, and, and potentially reduce total cost of ownership. Um, but it can do many things for you, um, cloud adoption. And uh, just wanted to sort of cast it in a, in a slightly different light um, as it being a, a tool to enable uh, uh, digital transformation. Um, what, uh, what uh, Cloud IS actually allows you to do in a lot of cases is offload um, quite a lot of uh, um, uh, tasks and effort that are associated with uh, managing the, the old world of, of uh, on-premise data centers. So hardware maintenance, um, patching operating systems, uh, antivirus, uh, and general infrastructure management, um, they can be uh, off, uh, loaded onto uh, service providers, um, freeing up resources within your organization to do um, more um, transformational um, uh, activities that, that uh, deliver real value to your organization and, and to your um, citizens. Um, the, way that, uh, the way that it can really help in these areas, um, the cloud IS solution gives you a, a a lower cost of entry, so um, the the cost of actually trying new things, um, spinning up servers to give something a go, trying a new piece of software, trying a new approach um, is, is vastly reduced. Um, and uh, application focused uh, engineers are able to um, deal with spinning up servers where previously you may have to um, it, um, had a, uh, a separate set of roles to, to cover that, um, which kind of reduces the, the agility um, of uh, trying out uh, new things. There's a, there's a lower cost of failure. That's another way of pitching it, really, um, being able to uh, try something. And you know, if it doesn't work out, um, admit, do you know what, that, that time it didn't pay out for us. Um, but because we haven't invested a large amount of money in, in long-term ICT assets, um, it hasn't actually uh, caused us uh, you know, any particular loss. Um, and it's just in general, it's just easier to try uh, new things. Um, and you know, all of these can add up to, to an increase in agility um, for your ICT service. Um, so on top of all the good things around resilience and total cost of ownership, uh, um, it really does uh, sort of grease the wheels of, of uh, transformation. So if you're considering um, cloud adoption, uh, it is uh, useful to, to conduct a, 
a cloud readiness assessment or a cloud adoption assessment. Um, this is something that uh, that I've I've done with a number of um, public sector bodies um, uh, whilst working for EduServe. Um, and really, this is looking at a number of indicators uh, across your organisation as to how ready you are for um, cloud adoption or, or further cloud adoption. Now, this set of indicators, one of them is technical readiness, um, and a large part of that is you know, how virtualised you are, how easy it is to to make uh, migrations of servers potentially. Um, but there are other indicators um, that look more at cultural and organisational aspects. Um, of, of your organization. Um, so just giving some examples, um, security is, is, is quite a significant one. So um, uh, talking with a, a, a public sector partner recently, um, they had an experience where um, every time they, they involved a new set of people around a cloud adoption uh, program, um, all the same questions around security came up. Um, and uh, you know, over and over again, they were having to justify that the cloud was secure enough, that the controls were sufficient, and so forth. Um, so, from a readiness point of view, having a, a, a top-down view of what um, appropriate cloud security is, what your um, information classifications are, what the security controls that you need to put in place to protect those are, and what is acceptable, um, is uh, is absolutely recommended um, because it stops you having to go over old ground as you as you're working through a cloud adoption program. Um, another area would be, you know, if you're you know, perhaps away from the IS side of things, looking at um, software as a service. So more and more um, adoption of software as a service. Um, understanding what it is you need from those providers in terms of uh, assurances around both security and resilience um, is pretty key. Um, so that when you're uh, procuring those services, um, you, you are ensuring that um, the, the high standards of security and availability that you, you currently have on your on-premise um, organization uh, will be replicated in the cloud and that you know, they're not uh, uh, offering you a SaaS solution off the back of um, a couple of laptops or something. Um, so you know, those, are, those are elements of um, a cloud adoption uh, readiness um, process uh, that you can put in place uh, and like I say that you know you can you can have help in uh, identifying where you are on that journey and what elements of um, uh, of readiness you need to um, invest some more effort in um, to, to have a, a smooth journey to the cloud um, so that that's my uh, perspective uh, for today's talk um, I'm going to hand over now to Omid who's going to talk you through his experiences of uh, deploying uh, a new IT operating model and developing new IT operating model uh, in the public and private sector. So over to you, Omid. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Good afternoon, everyone. A warm welcome to my uh, hopefully brief sermon on my experiences of building an IT operating model, um, but not just for cloud. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, I've worked in technology leadership roles over the last 15 years or so across multiple sectors. Uh, in the tertiary sector, I was last director of service at City University in London. In the private sector, I was CIO for an organization called Working Links. And in the public sector, I've had the pleasure of being interim CIO for the London Borough of Camden for the last 18 months or so. Um, and as I've worked across these different sectors, um, I found them obviously a very interesting learning experience and, and obvious, obvious lots of differences in the types of challenges that you face. Uh, but there is actually quite a striking similarity in the work that I've done, uh, and particularly in defining and designing new operating models for IT, uh, both in the cloud and a non-cloud world. So I thought I'd take the opportunity today to talk you through some of what I've learned. Uh, some of the mistakes I've made, uh, some of the approaches that I've taken to developing uh, IT operating models across different sectors, uh, but with a little bit more focus on the work I've led at Camden over the last 18 months or so. So, let's start with the operating model. Um, and first, so we're all on the same baseline uh, definition. And many, many cleverer people than I have researched and developed endless volumes of discourse about operating models, what they are, um, and depending on your management persuasion, you'll have a view about what it means and probably already use some kind of model yourself. 
Personally speaking, I've got quite a small brain, so I describe the operating model as a way of showing the types of things that I, the IT function needs to do for the organization that I'm working in. And what's quite interesting for me is that without failure across every sector and organization that I've experienced, not one of them has started with an operating model when thinking about the type of IT that they actually need. All of them have, uh, have started with one of these. Uh, yep, the trusty old org chart. And what I've found quite common is that the stakeholders I've worked for, um, for example, chief execs, finance directors, or chief operating officers, have all initially thought about IT from this perspective, the form rather than the function. And often um, what goes along with this org chart is uh, a spreadsheet with all the costs of these roles. And IT is already thereby positioned as a cost drain to the organization rather than the value creator. And at, normally at this point, there's also some view about insourcing and outsourcing of IT. Uh, and cloud obviously plays a, a part of that. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything fundamentally wrong with this. It's perfectly normal. But in my view, for an organization to really exploit technology, it needs to begin at a slightly different starting point than the old org structure. Uh, and they always say start with the most basic question. And I found this question uh, over the course of my career is the humdinger in order to actually start at the beginning. There we go, fantastic. So the question is, um, what exactly do we do here? And I normally follow that up with, can you show me that on a single page? Uh, and if I'm feeling really mischievous, I might follow that up with, why exactly do we do what we do here? Um, but my reflection is that there's a bit of a health warning attached to that. Most people I've ever asked that last question to have said, Omid, what a good question, humored me a bit, and then politely or sometimes impolitely changed the subject. Um, now, the reason I always start with, what does my organization do? is that I don't think you can create the appropriate IT capability in the cloud or not if you're unable to articulate what it will be delivering for. If you're fortunate enough and your organization has invested the time and resource into answering that question, someone should be able to put in front of you a single page which actually describes in some way what your organization does. And if they can't do that, then I found the very first thing that I've had to do um, is persuade the organization I'm working for that they need to invest a bit of resource into this design piece of work. And that is always a challenge because from their perspective, they've been existing perfectly fine in a world where this artifact doesn't exist and in a world where I'm saying that's now really important for the delivery of IT. And I've tried a number of analogies, uh, just a bit of a kind of reflexive learning um, to try to help tell the story about why this is important. Uh, most of them have been pretty crap, uh, including one about a gorilla fleas and midges that I used at one board meeting uh, that I was at several years ago that still haunts me vividly to this very day. But the one that does seem to land best is a narrative about architecture. Um, and simply put, nobody in their right mind would ever say to, uh, would employ a builder and say to them, you see that plot of land over there? I'd like a three bedroom, two bathroom house with a garage, please. Here's some money, and now I want to see your organizational chart and know exactly how many plumbers, electricians, and laborers I'm getting for the cash I'm giving you. There's a really good reason why construction starts with architectural design, but for some reason this principle seems to get lost in lots of organizations, particularly where IT is concerned. Uh, so I've been talking a while and have kind of flitted the word cloud here and there, but in a world where it's so easy for anyone in an organization to buy IT services on a credit card, having the starting point being what your organization does and then designing the IT operating model from there becomes even more important. Now, there are a few different tools that you can use to capture what your organization does. Um, in my experience, I've come to prefer the capability approach. And uh, so can you jump back? Um, which provides a common language and groups the things that your organization does into a single logical grouping. And when I arrived at Camden uh, in my first local government role, with the context of a desire to build a shared IT service across three councils, I did ask my questions, what do we do? And can someone show me on a page? 
and the answer to the first question was we do a lot and the answer to the second question was not on your Nelly so I commissioned a piece of work to do just that and uh, if we flick to the next slide you can see this is what the outcome looked like so a couple of things to point out in this artifact it might be a bit difficult to see uh, the quality is not that good um, but these are logical groupings of what a local authority, specifically Camden, does, but also actually what Islington and Harringay councils, the other partners in the, in the shared digital service, what they do. And dare I say it, this is probably exactly the same as what almost every other London local authority does, and probably most of the local authorities up and down the country. Now, we found that this picture helped provide a common language um, for us to deal with stakeholders in each authority um, because when you're no longer talking about individual org charts or services or teams you can have a much more objective conversation about ambition and strategy and you remove some of the baggage that comes along with the human ego um, the other thing that you can use this to do uh, and this next slide is a tiny bit busy um, but from a technology perspective, you can overlay all of your major line of business applications. And this helps to both highlight complexity, but also areas of commonality. And here it's color coded so you can see which boroughs have kind of which uh, applications. And you can then use this to drive the strategic conversation around what to share and what not to share, and again, how to, what types of services um, you need to deliver across your, your council. And again, in a cloud world, if you don't articulate all this up front, rather than actually enabling the organizational strategy, the technology investments that you make are likely to actually block what your organization is trying to achieve. I'll give you a tangible example of that. Uh, if, for example, there's an ambition to share a finance capability, an investment in a cloud finance system, might take you down a road of configuration and minimal process change and that has a cultural and organizational implication across any council in this case that may want to consume that service. Going back to my earlier comment about sourcing, uh, taking this kind of what do we do capability approach helps you get some clarity on your organization sourcing approach and the in consequent impact that will have on an operating model. So by way of an example, here is um, the three councils' different sourcing approach to the way they deliver housing. So you can kind of see from these color-coded sections here that these two councils deliver housing uh, internally, mostly in the same way. And this council um, doesn't. It uses an arm's length body and a trading company. And this is really useful um, insight to help your organization realize that the types of things that you need to do from an IT perspective in an in-house model are different than if you have a company vehicle. You know, if nothing else, the way you manage relationships on IT will be really different. Think kind of service level agreement versus partnering and influencing. Now I spent quite a lot of time in the what does my organization do space uh, and showing you examples of that simply because in my experience that's the hardest bit in developing the right operating model for your organization. Um, I found another couple of benefits as well. Um, one is that you get uh, uh, to engage with a lot of different stakeholders across all levels within your organization when you take this approach to developing your operating model. And not only does that help improve the reputation of IT, but actually during that process, you can identify key principles that help you design your operating model, key priorities, um, imperatives, pain points, opportunities, all of which, when uh, you come to actually designing the operating model, will be useful in making sure it's the right fit and then testing it back when you replay. And so you've got an example. Here is the finished article, um, or at least one of the last iterations of the operating model that we have proposed uh, that the shared digital service for Camden, Islington and Harringay uh, takes the form of. And based on the intelligence and data we gathered from what does our business do, 
this model was designed and tested with stakeholders across each council who actually then recognized why we suggested IT set up in this way and how it would enable them to deliver to their agenda, which is a mixture of transformation and efficiency. And I'll talk you, conscious of time, I'll talk you through very quickly this. Um, so at the top, you broadly can see the kind of demand side of IT managed with partnering um, that actually is grouped around the capabilities of those councils as well as um, facing off to each particular council. And what that gives you is, for example, partnership that is supporting housing um, and the approach to housing across three um, that then also has a responsibility for kind of executive management and relationships across each individual borough. And that gives you the ability to share um, as well as uh, the ability to um, kind of influence uh, strategic direction uh, in, in each authority. In the middle, this is kind of the delivery side of it. Uh, you can see there's a product approach here, um, and that logically groups again, and let's take housing again, the applications that would be delivering to the housing capability and would own end-to-end -end the life cycle of the development of that service. Um, so you can kind of think that um, if you're in a kind of cloud space, for example, and you're a cloud platform, the the types of roles that you need there need to be working, you know, road mapping, understanding uh, the upcoming releases and changes and working with the services to uh, plan those releases and actually implement them and embed them. And at the bottom here is the more kind of enabling services, so there's infrastructure, there's a capability we call that called cloud management, which also involves orchestration, and you can kind of start to see the types of roles and skills that you're going to need in your IT organization. And on the right here, um, this is my favorite bit, this is the um, what we call the pop-up teams and this is a capability that brings together uh, technical competency with kind of service users and in some cases residents or members and grouped around themes such as data and mobility. This is where projects and change are delivered very quickly, very iteratively. And then these teams kind of disband and go back into wherever they sit in the rest of the organization. So this kind of operating model describes the stuff that you want IT to do and how it fits in with your organization. And as I mentioned, you can identify the skills and roles that you need in each of these functions. And you, get, you then use that to get to that ultimate org chart that is so craved by uh, in most organizations. So what's all this got to do with cloud? Hopefully you've, uh, you've seen some of my thoughts littered uh, as I've been talking. Um, but Bear with me, we're getting a bit closer to that, that answer. Now, as we understand what the organization does, and we have a view of the stuff IT now needs to do, and how it all fits together, the next step I consider is the sourcing approach. Uh, and I suggest that this is done, in my experience, best uh, by assessing what the core competencies needed in IT are. And you do that based on the insight revealed by the kind of business capability work. Uh, and then you use that analysis to determine the sourcing strategy for components of your IT operating model. Um, and I tend to use this as a model. This is an AT Kearney model. Um, and you can kind of see here, I mean, it's not uh, to kind of Julian's point earlier, you can see suggested capabilities that potentially could be outsourced or delivered um, uh, in the cloud, and those that could be retained. And as you'd imagine, the higher kind of value IT capabilities like strategy, relationships, innovation, they're suggested that they're retained. And perhaps more commoditized capabilities like infrastructure are suggested to be outsourced. However, my reflection and learning is that actually this all depends on those core competencies that you identify in the design work. And I'll give you some tangible examples of that. Um, when I worked in higher education, for example, a key differentiator when we were doing this analysis was the services that directly interface with students. And for IT, this meant that a core competency was actually the IT and AV support teams that provided direct one-to-one -one service to students, and consequently our decision that that would never be outsourced or uh, sourced differently. And at the time I was leading that work, there was a massive drive to outsource services to drive down cost 
um, and you know my personal view on whether this thinking the fundamental flaw in this thinking uh, was there anyway using this kind of approach um, really helped me to explain to the organization why actually in that context for higher education outsourcing the IT service desk at that time just wouldn't be sensible and I contrast this with my last role in the private sector where actually the IT service desk and support capability as well we went through this process and it was identified as non-core and so actually it did make sense to buy that from a provider uh, which is indeed what I did this kind of sourcing assessment approach has two other implications specifically for cloud now I've used this model as an aid for internal IT staff as part of the kind of change management process for service redesign so by describing the roles that you need such as design analysis architecture orchestration uh, that are needed in an IT team that's kind of based higher up this this model um, has helped the people in my teams when I've gone through this process understand where they may fit in understand that they need to reskill and develop themselves to take advantage of cloud services or other uh, or the way the IT industry is going and to help the organization exploit them uh, for, for our own benefit and secondly this model um, you can start to see how you can make decisions on which part of the stack or if in you know if it is cloud for example you want to go which part of the cloud stack you'll need to start to buy in uh, as part of your strategy for example in one of my previous roles we decided that the infrastructure up to the OS layer was not something we needed to manage it wasn't a core competency so we started an infrastructure as a service program to move the compute to the cloud um, now that decision was suitable for that company at that time but I, I was also doing um, some work with a financial services firm who um, didn't go through all of this approach but when they were looking at what their core competency was they valued speed and low latency transactions so their decision was that that, that infrastructure stack was core and they needed to retain it in-house so as we hurtle towards the end of my allotted time uh, quite conscious that I'm probably running over um, I hope this has been a useful summary of an approach you can take to help an organization get the most from its IT by designing an IT operating model starting from what the business does um, and I promised you all a checklist so here it is this is my suggested checklist so resist the temptation to start from the org chart be strong and challenging get underneath the skin of your organization figure out what it does and get it on a page in doing so have those valuable conversations with your stakeholders senior leaders and customers identify what's important and then use that to build your model layer the technology on top of what your organization does that way you can see the gaps the opportunities and the strategic choices start to emerge figure out how your organization delivers its products and services and then align your IT model to cope with that draw up your IT model and test it with stakeholders playing back how it will enable your organization to deliver whatever your strategy is and agree and focus on what is core and develop your sourcing approach around this the technology choices that you make whether cloud or not should be based on the way you classify your competencies and what will give you advantage whether that's in the commercial context in the private sector or actually for the benefit of the public in the public sector so with that I, uh, I hope you found this webinar useful I've tried to, to pull out a smattering of reflections and learning as I've talked through uh, the approaches I've used in the past uh, but I'll finish up with one final comment about cloud um, now I see cloud as a really important way to provide capability but you can see from from here my starting point is not to build my model around the cloud it's always to start to build it around the business and hopefully this has given you some insight into, into uh, a way to do that so thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm happy to take any questions at the end, but for now I'll uh, hand over to Helena from Microsoft to provide her insight into that, in about what she's seeing across the private and public sector. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Ahmed. So um, I've got the pleasure today of very briefly highlighting uh, a couple of stories, and I'm conscious that it could well be that some of the folks listening on the line are the real owners of these stories. So uh, if that's the case, thank you very much. Um, and uh, you know, I, I know that you can't speak at the moment, but you may be able to communicate through the uh, through the chat. So um, there are. Um, some wonderful examples, I think, out in our um, local and regional government business of um, some super innovation coming down the line. And I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk you through a few examples of that. So uh, the first one um, that we've been privileged to be part of is the journey that Wolverhampton have been going on uh, towards creating their confident, capable council. Um, so I think the, the key thing to say here is uh, that, you know, Cloud has been a really important part, I think, of that journey, but actually it's been a journey of modernising how they provide um, services out to citizens. Cloud's part of that, but it's also been about enabling their staff with um, the latest and greatest technology uh, from a hardware point of view as well. So, so uh, you know, very kind of broad agenda. So, so what have they done, really? Um, they have empowered their staff um, by encouraging mobile and home working um, using Office 365 and Surface and a whole heap of, of, of other good technology under there. They've also modernised the um, back ends of their operations and, and migrated that over to the cloud, which has given them um, greater security and resilience. Um, and also, you know, has, has helped them tackle some of the challenges around cyber and what have you. Um, but, I, you know, I think the other thing that it, it will have done is to provide them with, uh, you know, great platform for innovation. Um, they have uh, managed to make very substantial savings, uh, which is, you know, which is fantastic. Um, and, and they've done that really through reducing uh, cost of facilities and, and resources. So very well positioned, I think, um, to start to make the most of some of what cloud has to offer. And I know that they're not alone and that there are other uh, organisations, I think Derby, Enfield and Somerset are, are some of the ones that, that we often speak about. But some, uh, some really great work has been, has been happening there. Right, I'll just click on to the next slide. Hopefully you can all see that now. Um, so if you were able to speak, I would ask you to guess where this is, but uh, I'm going to I'm going to let you know that's a beautiful picture of Kent, uh, where we've had the, the the privilege of working with a with a number of teams down there um, on how they can actually um, work together more effectively to provide citizen-centric services. So I think one of the uh, the biggest challenges that we face in our marketplace is uh, how we can actually do the heavy lifting of getting uh, the relevant political alignments to allow us to work you know with with other councils in the area but also um, with uh, health, police and schools as an example. So I know that uh, in Kent they've done some fantastic work to bring uh, the local health services into the fold. And sometimes the technology is probably the easiest part of the journey, uh, you know, and, and I, I don't underestimate the amount of work that goes into making sure that the political alignment is, uh, is there. What that's actually enabled them to do, though, is to um, give the citizen a greater responsibility for the data that they have. So, you know, the data in this sense is owned by the citizen, and that is enabled by having one unique um, ID for citizens across Kent. So really, really ambitious work that's going on uh, down in Kent. Now, you know, I think um, moving to the cloud is, is obviously is not trivial um, and sometimes it can feel like a long way off. But the last um, point that I really wanted to share with you is actually about some of uh, our earlier earlier adopters uh, to uh, cloud technology who are actually now entering the utopian world to which we all aspire of actual of real data led decision making um, so some of our early adopters are, are now really able to um, make use of their data to allow them to make day to day decisions from real time information displayed in modern dashboards whether that's at the exec level or elsewhere across their organization and that's allowing uh, the fact that they've got their data in one place in uh, you know 
uh, a space where it's possible to dial up and dial down uh, the amount that, that you need at a particular time is actually allowing them to start to make use of some of the uh, modern uh, data capabilities that are out there, machine learning and the like, uh, and that is enabling them to begin to try and identify where uh, they think they may have instances of vulnerable citizens who may be coming and needing to use their service at some point soon, whether that's you know folks in care or perhaps uh, children who are um, you know on the kind of at risk but you know not fully engaged with services yet, they can try and identify them early and take proactive action. It's also helping them. Uh, with their future financial plans. Um, so it's really lovely to see some of our customers who, you know, who've done some of the, the heavy lifting and really been through the complex work that, uh, that Omid was describing actually start to come out the other end and really, really be able to take advantage of, uh, you know, of what the cloud can offer them. Um, so in terms of how we can help, um, and I'll make this my, uh, my last point, um, you know, we are always looking uh, to partner with uh, with customers who are keen to innovate um, and keen to, to move quickly but um, one of the things that um, you know I, I also consider to be a, a privilege um, from a Microsoft standpoint is that we you know we do have a fantastic army of, of brilliant partners um, who are also able to to help you um, if you'd like to get in touch with me directly my email address is down there at the bottom um, but I know that the EdgeServe team will also be uh, available to discuss any of what I've just mentioned um, I think that's probably it from me thank you Helena Thank you very much, and thank you, Omid. Um, so I, I believe everybody has a uh, question button on their panel uh, in the webinar controls. So now's the time to post your questions, if you have any, for uh, Omid, Helena, or myself. Uh, give you a couple of minutes to, uh, to let some of those come through. Um, but I think that was very insightful from, from both Omid and Helena. Um, it's interesting to um, to see, um, particularly from Ahmed, the, the approach um, it sounds like a, a repeatable uh, approach of, of understanding uh, business or, uh, organization and what the core competency of each organization actually is. Uh, so we don't have any questions just at the moment. I, I have a question actually for Ahmed. Um, it's just something that. Uh, sprung to mind. Um, when you're talking about what businesses do, um, understanding what you do here, um, and then letting that feed on to technology choices, um, there's another way that you know perhaps some of the, the people who work within the organization might might see that is that to some extent the technical choices um, actually uh, creates their workflow and, and you know on a day-to-day -day basis define what it is they do. Uh, not so much what the organisation does, but what they do in, the, in you know when they're sitting at their desk. Um, and consequently, when you change things, you change. You you might end up doing exactly the same activities, but with a slightly different tool set, and that has an impact in terms of staff workflow. Um, I wondered whether you had any insight on on how you um, unblock that as a potential um, pain point. <coughs> That's a, that's a great question. So I'm um, playing that back to you. That's a how do you land organisational change with technology um, yes. in an organisation? Um, so uh, really bloody hard. I think is probably everyone's experience on this call. A um, couple of things that uh, I think you need to have in place to make it successful. Um, one, you need really strong sponsorship from whichever service or business area is changing so if you don't have the you know say what you want about the way organizations are but still the kind of hierarchy of an organization has a role to play so you know chief exec downwards making sure that they understand what it is you're changing and why and what benefit um, investing um, so all business cases to, to deliver any kind of technology or business change has has got to have a re the requisite uh, funding for um, change management. So if that's um, providing the capacity for training, presentations, roadshows, constantly communicating, 
um, branding whatever it is you want to do. So making sure that's in place and that the project pays for that as well. Um, and all the normal things like focusing on benefits. So if you're talking about if you're changing the technology that will have a workflow impact, there's got to be a reason that you're doing it. Um, and so getting your employees or whichever members of staff will be having to do something different to um, understand those benefits um, and to kind of replay them. And a couple of kind of tangible practical things that we've uh, I've done in the past and that I've seen also here at Camden. Um, having a change champion network really helpful. So people who are just you know want to be part of something and are helpful influences across the organization. We've got about 200 of those at Camden and I found them really helpful. Um, that's one thing, and then doing something like a, a day in the life of, um, where you take somebody who is, you know, who's daily using a system or a way of working, and you you kind of film them or, or have some kind of media that shows them how their journey and how they go from what, you know, one way of working to another, and their honest and reflective experience about that. Some will be good, some will be bad. So that's what I would suggest. Sounds good. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, we've got a couple of questions through, actually. Uh, first one um, from Kevin Taylor. Uh, to Ahmed, uh, what were the biggest challenges from a staffing slash organizational perspective uh, seen as an opportunity or a threat? How best to win the hearts and minds? I, I think you may have answered some of that just now, but... Um, uh, yeah, perhaps, so, uh, um, I think... More? Sure, I think... Uh, from an IT point of view, if this kind of question is specific around, you know, if we're sourcing in a different way or, or buying cloud, um, so the challenges are fear. Um, you know, people have been doing things in particular ways. So helping them, sh helping IT staff in particular see that their roles can evolve and not be removed, but they can change and develop. And actually, when you when you kind of position it that way, and people do a bit of reflection. They would have seen that in their careers anyway. We've gone through cycles, haven't we, in IT? Sure. So it's about helping them understand that. Um, that's uh, the main way. Excellent. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, and a question from Nicola Logan. Uh, we are currently on a Microsoft Navigator journey, and I wondered whether Microsoft follow a similar methodology when approaching the piece of work around the cloud operating model. Uh, perhaps that's a question for Helena. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, and to be honest with you, it's not one that I uh, have the answer to at my fingertips. So I sit in a slightly different division. But certainly, our cloud navigator um, projects begin with a with a root and branch understanding of the capabilities of the organisation. Um, so really understanding. You know what each individual is doing from a business point of view. So, um, you know, I was very impressed with what Ahmed had to say, and I, I think I think that we would be following a very a very similar route, um, and then helping you understand, you know, which bits of your IT infrastructure um, it makes sense to move. And and as Ahmed pointed out, you know, where do you want to actually draw that line in terms of some work that you might be able to get third parties involved in, and, and other areas. You know where that doesn't make sense given the nature of the service that you're trying to deliver. Um, so I'll happily take further questions um, on that one offline. Um, and uh, you know, if there's a kind of specific uh, specific underneath that, please just drop me a line. Thanks, Helena. Sorry, um, um, sorry can I just, just can I just add one? Yeah. May I just add one one point uh, just to echo something that Ahmed said about his? Uh, I think, forgive me. Uh, change champions uh, or influencers across the business. I've been involved in a couple of um, quite substantial change management projects in the, in the past and sometimes we found that there are people who are the doubting Thomases, forgive me, uh, and, and they can be quite influential and sometimes actually yeah, picking but... somebody who you think might be a bit of a blocker to become a champion is yeah. tough in the beginning but um, a really, really uh, you know, really good idea in terms of actually making sure that your project is successful. I just wanted to chuck that one in there too. Thanks, Helena. Thank uh, so I don't think we've got any more questions. I don't know if anybody's uh, currently typing one, um, but uh, I think that's probably a wrap. Um, so 
uh, I think we were just discussing here about email addresses, whether um, uh, we'll issue them to participants uh, with the recording. Um, so if you do want to get in touch with Helena, uh, we'll make sure that you've got the uh, the means, and, and uh, likewise to Omid uh, and myself. Um, that would be fine with me. Yeah. Yeah, fine uh, with me. We do have a question. Uh, so Andy Crawford, um, thanks Omid. That's the simplest approach to creating a target operating model that I've heard. Um, <laughs> are you willing to share the slides and or templates of the deliverables? Uh, no harm in asking, is there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm happy to have a conversation about it. Um, some of that is IP for kind of the, the development of the service here, but my personal view is actually uh, we're all in this together in local authorities, so we should be sharing. So if we can pick that up offline, uh, see what I can do. Absolutely. Sounds good. I wouldn't mind seeing those as well. Um, <laughs> <Same here. laughs> so uh, with that, I think uh, I think it's a wrap. Um, we'll be distributing a video um, version of this with audio um, uh, after um, we, it's all been uh, processed. Um, but thank you very much for everyone for joining. Thank you to our speakers, Omid and Helena. Um, I wish you all a good afternoon. <laughs>